Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. Still with me in the studio is Archbishop Njongong Kulundungane. He is founder and president of African Monitor. He has been described as an activist bishop, a pastor, a theologian, a thorough organizer, and a planner. Let's talk about the planning aspect. And let's talk about the work that you are doing at African Monitor. What moved you, having retired from the church, to then start off on another project, but not just within South Africa, Pan-African, and indeed global? Well, you can't retire from God, can you? <laughs> uh, Until you go to meet him. I, I think that uh, one of the motivating issues is that I've got a passion for my continent. Uh, I've got a passion for people. I've got a passion for development. I think what started me was that whole hype on Africa uh, around the Glen Eagles uh, conference uh, where there were pledges that were going to be made to Africa. And one of the things that I said we needed to, to, to do was to monitor those pledges. What uh, do the G8 countries actually give to Africa? Mm. And what do African governments do with that, what's, what's, what's given to them? And what do they do in terms of their own uh, policies mm. for Africa's development? And thirdly, and most importantly, uh, what impact uh, does that have on the ground? Yeah. So this is what motivated us. Uh, but it's uh, being involved uh, broadly in Africa's development agenda. And I think that uh, we have had uh, a review uh, of uh, our work as African Monitor. We have now come out um, with a theme for the next three to five years, which is uh, unlocking Africa's moment. Uh, and I think that our focus uh, is on women and young people as key stakeholders. We're a grassroots focused entity uh, so that for us uh, it's not just a question of uh, GDPs that matter. It's a question of the people's lives on the ground. Yeah. How much uh, improvement uh, there is uh, for them. So we monitor for the sake of advocacy for policy change. Yeah. Now, as the world swims through economic crisis, we've got the US uh, battling its uh, debt problems. We've got Europe also in trouble. And China, in the meantime, trying to keep uh, the world on a, uh, the global economy on an even keel. Do you get the sense that the agenda is shifting slightly? that Africa's moment was very brief, and it indeed may well have come to an end before it even started. I don't think it's, it's, got, it's come to an end. Is it still uh, there? No, no, I think that uh, we're going to roll. Uh, I think we have got to recognize that Africa's economies have been growing in spite of uh, the crisis uh, worldwide. Uh, we have got to bear in mind that uh, Africa is a young continent with a lot of uh, potential uh, we've got to bear in mind that we've got the resources, uh, uh, rich in resources. Mm -hmm. And I think what mm -hmm. we need to do is to find a way uh, of uh, empowering people uh, so that they benefit. Uh, we need to find a way in which the ruling elites of this uh, continent don't get away uh, with uh, taking the resources, uh, but rather that the uh, Africa's resources are plowed back for the well-being of the people. Mm. And that is why at African Monitor we're a grassroots focused uh, entity mm. uh, where people on the ground uh, matter. Because people uh, tell us uh, through poverty hearings, through citizens forum, uh, that people want to eke out their own existence. Uh, and they want to be given the wherewithal uh, to do that or to have access uh, to those resources. And that's what we are busy uh, trying to do at African Monitor. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people around the world who will be wishing you well. But let's talk about the life that you have led. I mean, you're pushing on to 70, and uh, it's been a life that's been uh, full and fulsome, I'm hoping. But let's go back to the beginning. That spark in prison that decided you to say, I want to serve God and nothing else. How was that? Why was it? Well, it was a uh, wrestling with God. I wrestled with God on Robin Island, uh, saying that how can a good God allow so much suffering in South Africa, in the world, and in particular uh, on Robin Island, when you had uh, people uh, who had given their lives for a just society, 
And I think that it was at that moment where I sort of experienced a uh, calmness uh, as if God had touched me, as if uh, that little voice of God said, I want to use you mm. for the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. Was it a particular incident? Was it maybe one of the gods being a little harsher than normal? What was it? Well, Robin Island was hell on earth. And I think if you read uh, my book uh, and other people have written about Rob Robin Island, it was hell on earth. Uh, the immensity of the suffering and the tenseness uh, of the suffering and my wrestling with God, mm -hmm. looking across the sea mm -hmm. at the majest majestic uh, Table Mountain and say, there's the goodness of God and goodness of creation. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, we experience such suffering uh, in this particular way. Yeah. So how did you keep faith in that harsh environment? It's the resilience of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Uh, every evening we sang in Kosciuszko Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those blessings of God uh, enabled us to uh, pull through. Uh, it's those uh, kind of experiences uh, that uh, you cannot explain. Yeah. Uh, you cannot give a rational explanation yeah. why uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, after 27 years in jail, became the apostle of forgiveness and reconciliation mm -hmm. par excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, it is those strange uh, workings yeah. uh, of the divine uh, in trying to bring uh, order uh, where there is chaos. Yeah. Were there moments through those long and dark nights when you doubted that things would change? I never doubted a moment. We knew that we yeah. uh, would get out and be free, but the question is when? Uh, and mm -hmm. and the, the presenting issue that took me to Robin Island mm -hmm. uh, was our fight against the past laws, which were at the heart of the uh, oppression of the black person. Uh, it took 30 years uh, before that was done, although we had thought mm -hmm. it would take three years to do it. <laughs> uh, but this is uh, the nature of, of uh, the struggles for justice. Yeah. So three decades later and a lot of work gone down, uh, I don't want it, I can't say down the drain. So I have to say a lot of work done and uh, uh, a lot of achievements done. When you look at that long life, when you look at that long period of service, just give us a sense of uh, those key points, those key peaks that you hit during that time. I think that one of the key things that I thank God for is my leadership in the uh, Jubilee 2000 mo mo movement. This is about the cancellation of, of the debt owed to... The heavily indebted poor nation. Yes. Uh, it took me to join uh, Jubilee 2000 uh, Latin America, Jubilee 2000 um, uh, Africa, and I was privileged to pilot a motion at a Lambeth conference in 1998, that's a conf conference of all Anglican bishops, uh, whereby we focused uh, on the debt cancellation. Mm -hmm. And I'm pleased mm -hmm. to say that through those efforts, we managed to get uh, the debt uh, cancelled uh, for the majority of people. Uh, uh, what satisfies you most about that? Because some people, some cynics would say, sure, the debt got cancelled, but a lot of the money ended up in the pockets of uh, the politicians again. I have to go back there. Yeah, but I think that in some instances uh, we had countries that uh, opened doors for children to go to school. Mm. Uh, and so there were some pluses sure. uh, in some countries. Mm. Uh, it was not that bad. And of course, some people do line their pockets. Mm. Uh, but I think that this is where we are, why we are mm. uh, in terms of monitoring that uh, resources are placed uh, in the right position. Sure. And the peaks in your personal life? Sorry. The peaks in your personal life? The d d d d d d I think that is when uh, the uh, elective assembly uh, of the Anglican Church in Southern Africa uh, elected me. Over 500 people gathered. Mm -hmm. uh, I was mostly humbled uh, by that election uh, mm -hmm. as Archbishop of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. uh, and going back to my life, uh, a young man who, though coming from a priestly home, never wanted to become a priest, mm -hmm. uh, but then ending up being an Archbishop of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look back, a lot of work has been, uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of writing about you, but you've also written. So let's talk about the book and what inspired it. 
What did you think of? W what was it that made you say, let me put my thoughts together and synthesize them and show them to the world? Well, uh, strangely enough, uh, it was a journalist uh, who said, Archbishop, what you don't like to be remembered about? And I said, a world with a human face. And that actually started me thinking about writing my first book, uh, which is about uh, the kind of world I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, your sense about the world with a human face, again, how far are we from that uh, I think that world. one of the things uh, I said actually on my birthday when I turned 70, my birthday wish uh, is that I'd like to see every child of Africa having all what is basic for human life, such as access to food, to water, uh, to health care, to education, uh, to clothing and to shelter. Mm. Uh, that is my wish, that was my birthday wish in April. And I think that uh, it is something that we have got to uh, labor for. Yeah. Just as uh, our predecessors, uh, the leadership of Africa mm. in terms of uh, all, uh, uh, organization for African unity, mm. uh, said we will not rest until every square inch of Africa has been liberated. And I think that I'm saying that uh, I will not rest, maybe I'll be pushing the daffodils when that comes up, uh, but I will not rest and I want to imbue this kind of spirit uh, to the young people of Africa that we shall not rest, we ought not to rest mm -hmm. uh, until every child of Africa has got access to what is basic for living. Yeah. And the good thing is that uh, I'm finding uh, some motivational leadership uh, among young people. In fact, I spoke uh, to a group of young people, a forum uh, for African universities at the University of Cape Town. Uh, some enthusiastic young people mm -hmm. uh, who are wanting a change uh, in terms of values, mm -hmm. ethical leadership, motivational leadership mm -hmm. in our continent. And I think that's where we should put our investment, mm -hmm. modeling that future leadership uh, of the continent. We've got a minute remaining and I wanted two thoughts from you. One, your, uh, what keeps you awake at night? And secondly, what gives you hope going forward? What gives me hope uh, when I look at the young uh, people of our continent uh, in broad terms, uh, uh, their commitment mm -hmm. uh, to make a difference uh, in our continent. Uh, when I see, for instance, uh, a young professional uh, leaving uh, the bright lights uh, of the Big Apple and coming to the continent to say, I want to make a difference mm -hmm. uh, in my continent. When I see uh, the diaspora uh, keen uh, in terms of making a difference in our continent, I think that gives me hope. What that keeps you awake? What keeps me awake is the, is the elites, uh, the elites, the political elites, uh, where there's no political will. Uh, when we've got so much uh, resources in our continent. That keeps me awake and I think that uh, this is why I say we need to do something about ethical and moral leadership in our continent. Uh, have motivational leadership, investing in the young people so that uh, we have got a bright future. Archbishop Winston Jongongkulundungane, thanks very much indeed, recipient of uh, the Baobab, uh, where do I have my notes now, recipient of the Baobab uh, in silver from the Republic of South Africa. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. us tonight. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.